There's a question that everyone asks frequently, and usually they probably ask me a little bit more frequently, is, is this, how do you know God's will for my life? How many of you guys have ever asked that? Well, how do you know God's will? Let me tell you a couple, a couple stories. Uh, one, when we were children's pastors, we were in a town called Mont Bellevue, Texas. Uh, it was a small town, a town of 1,200, and, and we got there. And within two years, our pastor, re- well, the youth pastor resigned, and the senior pastor resigned, and, and Greg was holding down the fort, 23 years old, holding down the fort, running staff meetings. They didn't prepare me to run staff meetings in Bible college. I was like, I just did what the last guy did. Okay, everyone have a problem? Okay, no one has a problem. And then all of a sudden, as we were searching out God's will for our life, everyone would tell me, well, Greg, the pastor's gone. You got to go. That's, that's, that's protocol. You got to go because the new guy's going to come in and wipe everyone out and take everyone, bring his, all of his staff. And so I remember, so we put our names out there, and all of a sudden, we got several, several different uh, people that were like, hey, let me, let me talk to you about becoming our next children's pastors. And, and we're talking to one place. Uh, in Louisiana, and it was, it was God. And the only reason why I say it was God, because it was a $15,000 raise, and I said, thank you, Lord, you are good, because we were making, like, we were making beans where we're at. I mean, we were like, man, why do we, we never have a no, like, what's going on? And all of a sudden, I said, oh, the Lord is good. And so we move, we move our whole family. Dom, I think, is like eight months old or something. So he's, he's fresh, and he's, he doesn't know what's going on. And we move into Shreveport, Louisiana. We're like, it is the Lord, yes. And let me tell you, it was the most difficult season of my life. In fact, I think it was like a month went by, and I'm in my office going, God, are you there? Like, it was one of those seasons where, man, I felt like, God, I couldn't, I, I couldn't pray enough. I couldn't read my Bible enough. I just could not hear from God. And I just, I wrestled with that, like, oh, man, I'm, I'm praying. I'm doing all these things, and I just can't hear from God. And it was, it felt like a desert. And I remember talking to my friend going, man, I think I blew it. I think I, I missed hearing from God. And he was like, Greg, God is with you wherever you go, which is good. It sounds great, but when you're not following the voice of God, it just sometimes it's a little tough. And and we we lasted we lasted a whole year, a whole year there, and and it was it was the most difficult place, just just where we're at, and we won't go into any details because it was just tough. And then we we leave that place, and we left with a memory of saying. I think I missed hearing from God because what I did was I let the $15,000 raise be that God that was like, oh, hey, this is, it, this is good. It must be God. And then all of a sudden, about five, well, a little over six years ago, we felt another shift and we felt another call to move. And, and we were determined, okay, we, we learned this mistake. Now I want to know God's voice. And, and it's amazing when you're like in that desperate situation, good intentioned people, what they do is they're like, hey, you should go here. You'll be taken care of financially. You should, I'm like, but look, no, I, I, I heard that before. I'm not going to fall for it again. And, and as, we, as we process through, okay, what God was doing, kind of my, my philosophy kind of developed into this, okay. And, and this is what I would do. I'd say, Lord, do you want me to apply for this job over here? I, I, and people are like, you're like, really? I, I would. I would say, okay. Okay. So I, w- I would go forth. And, and I felt like if I just took a step, then he would correct me in the process. But I needed to be listening. And I remember we were driving through a town in Illinois, and God just dropped something in my lap. He says, if you could go anywhere, where would you go? And I was like, oh got options now that's never that's awesome and i said well i'd move in this location i didn't tell them where the location was but then along the path people came alongside of me and just kind of confirmed what god was doing and then we th- we said yes god is taking us to texas and that's where we're going i boldly proclaimed that on a sunday morning i was like god's taking us to texas and a good friend of mine a vietnam war vet a man of god came up to me and says greg that's not where you're going it's close but it's around that area and then god brought us here 
and when he brought us here, it was one of those moments of going, okay. And the crazy part is people go, well, how'd you get here? I tell them all the story, and they're like, hey. And the last thing I said, Pastor Rod, I remember sitting in his office. He says, hey, you want to do this? I'm like, let's do it. And then he's like, we should probably talk about money, right? I was like, man, don't worry. You'll take care of yourself. I didn't care. Not because I didn't want ever to get paid ever, but I, at that moment, I was like, I just want to be where God has. And if God puts me where he wants, then he'll take care of the rest. And so I say that because we want to know God's will for our life. Sometimes we Google God's will for our life, God, what, through Google. And, and we say things like, God, if you want me to do it, let the next car that comes by be red. Okay, it was a black car. Okay, red car. Lord, next one. Okay, and second to next one. Okay. Uh, if Pastor Greg stops and talks to me, this will be the confirmation that I am supposed to do that. God, if, if this is your will, let them call me today. See, we create tests that have no basis in Scripture. And we dictate to God how he is supposed to direct us. Then if, if that doesn't work, you then amend the test to match your desires. Okay, God, if, if the next car is, is yellow, okay, the next one is yellow, right? You're like, oh, there's been a lot of yellow cars. The next one has to be yellow, and you're like, oh, man. Or we create different things. If she calls me today, if they offer it for free, if I don't get a raise, then I'll know it's, your, it's, it's you, God. See, what makes it even more difficult is if people who give you a word from God. How, how do you know that if it's a really a word from God or just someone telling you what you want to hear? How do I know God's will for my life is, is a difficult and important question. It's not always clear or easy, but you really want to know how to discern God's word for your life. Then there's the opposite challenge. Some of you have been in situations where God was very clear. You know what scripture says, you've listened to your spiritual authorities and the people who love you and, and have your best heart and you've, you've prayed and you know what you're supposed to do, but then you just don't do it. Don't come talking to me then, okay? I'll just tell you the same thing. What are you not doing that God has told you to do? See, you know you're supposed to break up with that guy, but you don't. You know you're supposed to sacrifice and give generously. But you don't. You know you aren't supposed to, go, to get back in that dysfunctional relationship. You know, but you keep doing it. Maybe God has said, hey, I want you to move. And you look and you go, ah, I just don't have what I need to have to move, God. But God is telling you to move. You know you aren't supposed. Maybe you're not supposed to make that move. But you do it anyways. See, you know God's will. You just don't want to do what it says. But still others of you, well, you, you were sure you knew what God wanted you to do. You had a verse, a, a word, some advice, and all the circumstances and, and signs pointed to the, the decision being God's will for your life, but it turned out to be a mistake. It cost you time, money, relationships, influence, maybe even your reputation. See, you were wrong, but what happened? Just because it looks like a good thing, it sounds like a God thing, and it feels like a God thing, doesn't necessarily mean it is a God thing. Just because someone gives you a word from God doesn't mean that this is automatically God's will and plan and direction. Just because all the circumstances seem to say go, God's will still might be saying no. See, it's a little confusing, but the good news is God wants you to understand, and he wants you to know his will for your life. And in the, in the big life-altering decisions and, and in the smaller details. And so today we're going to look at another story in the life of David. And, and how he learned a valuable lesson about decision-making and discovering God's will for his life. And before we start, let me set the stage for you. David was anointed by Samuel to be the future king of Israel. The only problem is there was a current king. His name was Saul. They, he didn't like it very much. Because he was the king of Israel at the time. And he wasn't ready to step down and give up his, his position. So David waited. Then David faced an intimidating giant, an enemy called Goliath. Then David killed Goliath and he became the people's favorite. People sang songs that we find in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 7. It says, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. 
As you might imagine, David, well, he didn't like that song at all. And David was a threat to Saul's power, his position, and even his legacy. So Saul decided, well, David needed to die. So fearing for his life, David fled, and that's where we pick up the story. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, it says this, After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of Engedi. So Saul took 3,000 of his chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats, a mountainous area with lots of caves. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back into the cave. See, Saul and, and his men, they were, they were riding around. They were looking for David. And when Saul needed to go to the bathroom, he spotted a cave. And he decided, hey, that would be a good private place to go to the bathroom. Now, it just so happened that David was in the exact same cave. The Bible doesn't say why, but we can guess someone with David saw Saul and 3,000 men coming, and David had only 400 men. They could fight, they could run, or they could hide. So they decided to hide. And Saul got in front of that very cave, and well, then he had to go to the bathroom. So you never, you know, you, when you're riding down the road, and you're like, oh, you just passed a, a, a rest stop, and you're like, okay, and all of a sudden your kid's like, I gotta go to the bathroom, and it's like, Really? And so they always do it at the, at the most unopportune time. And so day, Saul is coming, and he's going. He's like, oh, got to go to the bathroom. He was completely defenseless. Remember the situation. David had been anointed king. So for that to happen, Saul had to be removed. And David was in the cave where, where Saul came, alone and unarmed. And in verse 4, it says, the men said to David, this is the day that the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. They're saying, this is your chance, David. Sneak up on him. Kill him quick and easy. Then we can walk out of this cave and declare that you are the new king of Israel. This is what God had promised us. Everything pointed to killing King Saul as God's will. David had a promise. And the circumstances, guess what? They all lined up. His men who loved him said, this is it. This must be God. What were the odds? Saul would pick this cave. Look at all these caves, David. But Saul picked this cave on this day where we are hiding. It has to be God, right? You've been there. When the circumstances lined up with your prayers and your desires, it's very difficult to imagine that this isn't the will of God. You weren't even looking for that new boyfriend. Broke up with the old one, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh my goodness. This boyfriend comes, you're like, oh my goodness. Or that girlfriend comes into the picture, and you're like, I wasn't even looking for that person. They had their, everything that you prayed for. God would someday bring into your life a, a Christian. They go to church, and, and they like the same stuff. They read the same version of the Bible. You're like, oh my goodness, Lord, we were made for each other. It's amazing. It can't be a coincidence. It must be God been praying about that new job and maybe you've you've got an opportunity that lines up exactly what you've been praying for and you say this must be God when circumstances line up with your heart's desires and your prayer requests your tendency is to assume that this must be God and to that the advice of people who love you and look look at your circumstances and say well there's no way this is a coincidence it is a God thing when all things line up, it's almost impossible to come to the conclusion that this may not be from God. See, I can tell you many times I've heard this story. I've, I've been praying for a spouse. I'm lonely. This person just came into my life. It, I, it was an unbelievable set of circumstances. There's no way it's a coincidence. This must be God and his will. Well, they are so sure it must be God that they blow past any concerns that I may have. And they say, Pastor Greg, I know what you're saying. I know how it looks. I know what everyone else is saying. But when you look at all the circumstances, it must be God. Maybe some of you are right now you're about to make a big decision. And before you act, I want to give you another perspective. God has not left you 
up to interpret circumstances and ask other people to interpret your circumstances. Let's, let's, there's more to it than that. And, and the question is why? Well, because there are no emotion-free circumstances. Think about the last big purchase you made. There were some emotions that were attached to it. You love that car. That's the one. It's perfect. Some of you even name your car. That's a little weird, but you do. Y'all laughing because you you're the ones, right? You're like, oh, you got me, right? Many of you have a credit card date that you wouldn't have if the emotions weren't attached to the circumstances. You saw something, you felt something, and you heard about it. You had to have it. It was calling my name. You made a decision you shouldn't have based on what? Your emotions. Some of you have a horrible pattern of dysfunctional, unhealthy relationships. You ask, how was I ever so stupid? I couldn't see, I couldn't, why couldn't I even see that? Because there were a lot of emotions involved that hindered your ability to think and even see straight. See, that's what happens when your emotion gets attached to a circumstance is it clouds your ability to rightly determine what is from God and what isn't. See, that afternoon in the cave, there was a lot of emotion. There was hatred, jealousy, fear, and, and anger. David, David fought for Saul. He risked his life for him, and then Saul turned on him. He chased him out of Israel. Saul was the man who ruined David's reputation. Saul was keeping David from the throne promised by God. The emotion said, I want you to kill him. Take your rightful place as king and just kill him. There's no way that this is not a God thing because the only God could arrange these circumstances. But David, because had already experienced what happened when he took matters in his own hands, David did the opposite. You'd, you'd expect, but for David's example, you can learn what to do when we're trying to figure out God's will in the face of unbelievable circumstances. It says, David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. David was close enough to kill Saul, but instead he cut a little piece off his robe. Verse 5 says this, afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to this, his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed or, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went away. Why did David miss his chance to kill Saul? Why did David know that the rest of his men didn't know? In the middle of an incredibly emotion-packed circumstance, David made his decision based on three things. Number one was this, first, the law of God. It's almost unbelievable that David could think straight with so many circumstances and all the emotion that's piled onto it. But David knew, I cannot raise my hand against my master. This is the king, and it's against the law to kill the king. But David, Saul is hunting him. I know, but, but God has already addressed this issue. It is against law to kill the king. Secondly, David considered the principles of God. David said Saul is the Lord's anointed. So God put him in place. It's God's responsibility to remove Saul, not ours. But look at what he did. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter if God put him there, then wait for God to take him out of there. David remembered the powerful principle. You don't displace or replace what God has put in place. See, if you, if you find, if, if, if you try to, you find yourself in a rebellion against God, the, the third thing David considered was the wisdom of God. What do I want to look back on? What is the wise thing to do in light of my future hopes and dreams? What is the wise thing to do in light of where I'm headed? Where are you going and what's the wise thing to do? David thought, do I want to be the king that one day, when someone comes up to me and says, how did you become king? I, say, I would say, well, one day I was hiding in a cave. King Saul came in, took off his robes, and started to go to the bathroom. And in the dark, I snuck up behind him and I stabbed him to death. That's how I became king. I can hear it now. People say, oh, David, you're, you're so brave. What a courageous thing. Walk, walk in the darkness of a cave while a 
guy is going to the bathroom, and you kill him. Do you know what else David knew? Kings who became kings by killing other kings usually were killed by the next guy who wanted to be the king. It's kind of that reaping and sowing. David knew if he manipulated the circumstances to become king, that he would never know if God put him there or if he put himself there. He would never have the confidence to face the future and say, God, I don't know how to handle this, but this is not my issue. You put me here. See, there are times you need to know, you need to know that you are where God put you. When God puts you here, you need to know you are in the job that God put you in. You need to know that you're in the marriage because God put you there. You need to know that you're in a city or a church because God put you there. See, when trouble comes, you need to know there, there is, this is where God has put me. If you're always wondering, well, did I manipulate the situation? Did I arrange this? Will you have, you'll never have enough confidence to face the future and say, this is God's deal. He got me here, and he can keep me here. Because what God has arranged, God can sustain. See, wisdom says, what do I do? What, what do I want to look back on? David didn't, didn't want to look back on, on a murder. So David, we're not, we're not going to touch the king. I know it doesn't seem like there's a way that this could be a coincidence. This is against the law. It violates a principle, and it's not the wise thing to do. The circumstance said, this is your moment. This must be God. But when David considered the law, the principles, and the wisdom of God, his decision made perfect sense. Some of you are on the verge, maybe, of a, a big decision. You're weighing the options. Your friends are saying, there's no way that this is a coincidence. This has to be God. Only God could arrange those circumstances. And when your circumstances line up with your heart's desire, your emotions, and your prayer requests, it's almost impossible to find a way to go in a different direction. See, there's so much momentum, there's so much emotion behind the situation. You have a lot of decisions to make, decisions in relationships, finances, the future, goals, colleges, and lots of decisions. But God wants you to bring all of those things to him and to say this, God, here's how I feel. Here is what the circumstances says. Now, what does your word say? Is there a law or a principle that addresses these particular options? God, I want to know if, even though I may not want to hear it, deep in my heart, I really want to know. I really want to know your will for my life. I don't want to make a decision based on my emotions that ends in disaster. So when you're facing a decision... I want you to ask these three questions. Number one, does this option violate God's law? Does this option violate God's law? Is there anything in God's word that, that this option that I'm considering violates anything? You may say, well, well Greg, that's, that's obvious. You'd, you'd be surprised. People say, I knew I was supposed to get a divorce when I met this new person. People enter into relationships and partnerships that, that clearly violate God's law, and people make financial decisions that go against God's law. Think of how many people refuse to give God 10% of their income. They knowingly violate God's law because of their circumstances, and then they still expect the blessings. Number two, does this option violate a principle? You learn the principles by spending time in God's word and listening to God's appointed leaders. If, if, you, if, if your God-appointed leaders are hesitant, then you need to slow down. I can tell you how many times someone has come and says, the emotions are there, the circumstances are there, and they're ready to go. And I say, you need to slow down, but they won't. They just rush into the decision, and they regret it later. Here's the third thing. Here's the third Thing, is this option the wise thing to do? When I think about my future hopes, dreams, marriage, children, financial, uh, my ministry, etc., does this option hinder me from becoming and doing what I know God wants me to be or to do? Get in the habit of looking beyond your circumstances. 
and asking these questions. I don't, I don't want to leave with you with the impression that you should never listen to the people around you. But as you listen to your friends, your pastors, your spiritual leaders, as you listen to me, listen through this grid, is what he is suggesting in line with the law of God. Not it was it a catchy, was it a catchy little phrase we like to say, but does it, does it align with the law of God? Does what she is suggesting line up with the principles of God? Does what she is suggesting line up with the wisdom of God? Don't just say, tell me what to do. Instead, say, I want to know what you want me to do. When I was in college, I had this opportunity to do an internship. I wasn't looking for it, but an opportunity to do an internship earlier than I, probably what I was supposed to. So I interviewed with the pastor, and he was like, we'd love to welcome you on our team and do this internship. And I remember praying about it and asked God, okay, God, is this what you want me to do? I called my dad, and, and you know what my dad said? My dad said, Greg, I don't think you should do it. I said, okay. And he said, you know, you gotta, you, we got we to gotta get you ready for the next, so you got to work a ton. We gotta, I said, okay. So he was giving me wisdom of like, hey, I, I need to make some money so I can get back to the next semester. But deep down, I thought, man, I, the more I prayed about it, the more I thought about it, the more I sought God about it, I really felt like I needed to do the internship. And I was like, man, like, now I'm like conflicted. Do I, okay, I feel like God's telling me to do this. My earthly dad is telling me not to do it. Okay, now what do I do? And I had the toughest conversation with my dad. I remember talking to him on the phone saying, Dad, I understand what you're saying. Yes, I do need to make money <laughs> to pay for the next semester. But I really sense God wants me to do this. And he said, okay. And man, I agonized over that. And, and as I went to my internship, it wasn't easy. Things happened. But in the craziest way that God met the needs that I needed to meet, and he met him in a very different way. And sometimes when we, when we look at these things, the question is, what is, does this option violate God's law? Does this violate a principle? Is it a wise thing to do? You may, God may be telling you to do something and everyone around you is saying, saying, that's not how I would do it. But if you look through this grid and you say, well, this lines up with what God is telling me to do. So even though circumstances are screaming one thing, maybe everything's pointing to killing the king and then you can be the king. Instead, look at God's law, his principles, his wisdom. Have the courage to say, God, I want your will of my, for my life. But I'm not going to get caught up in the emotions. I'm not going to get let the circumstance or what people are saying cause me to decide because when we do God's will people are going to look at you like you're crazy sometimes they'll be like I don't, I don't understand it it's okay it's not for them to understand it's for us to be obedient and then this if you say this is God I must be willing to test my options by your law your principles and your wisdom so that's how we test those things. See, God who loves you wants to make his will known to you. He wants to make the way clear to you. He wants to show you if you slow down and allow God to speak in your life. Maybe you just got to wait and stop doing and just wait and sit there and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? So this morning, if you're facing maybe decisions that you got to make, Maybe you're facing circumstances and you're just like, man, I don't, I don't know what to do. I want to pray for you today. If that's you this morning, I, just, I want you just to raise your hand and I, and I want to pray with you. We won't call you down. We won't embarrass you. But I just want to pray with you today, this morning.